I'm David Gibson. I'm the director of the Center on Religion and Culture here at Fordham and your host for this evening for this event, China's New Civil Religion, a challenge and opportunity for the West for engagement, as we say. A talk by our China expert, Ian Johnson, and a response from Kiareto Yang, who's in Shanghai, and questions from you all, the audience. So we welcome all of you here to Fordham uh, this evening in person and to the many joining us from around the world via Zoom, finally. Uh, we're very pleased to hold this presentation on this tremendously important and urgent topic, religion in China. And I want to stress that this event is made possible by the work and support of our co-organizers and our co-sponsors the U.S.-China Catholic Association, the China Academic Consortium, and the China Source. And before we start our official presentation, I just want to invite uh, the Vice President for Partnerships and China Engagement at China Source, Joanne Pittman, to step up briefly and tell you a little bit about these organizations. Joanne? Thank you, David, and everybody for the chance to be here tonight. This lecture is part of a joint lecture series sponsored by the U.S. China Catholic Association, China Academic Consortium, and China Source. And our aim is to explore Christianity and culture in China, both from the current situation as well as a historical perspective. The China Academic Consortium, the mission of that organization is to nurture, equip, and grow mainland Chinese scholars and to enhance understanding between China and the West. They have a worldview seminar this summer, as well as an online book club, and you can visit their website if you want to find out more information. China Source, the organization that I represent, our mission is to educate the global church on issues facing Christians in China and to connect Christians inside and outside China. We do this through online publications and uh, webinars and events, you can find us at chinasource.org. The U.S.-China Catholic Association um, is, was founded in the 80s, and their mission is to, um, to maintain fraternal ties between Chinese brothers and sisters and those outside of China. And um, they wanted to highlight, they have a study tour hopefully coming up this summer to China as well as an international conference that was going to be held in the Chicago area. So that's, those are the organizations that pulled this together, and we thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Joanne, and I really can't thank you enough for these organizations that have helped bring this about and connect us directly with, with uh, China. Um, and also a shout out to Father Michael Agliardo, a Jesuit who's head of the U.S. Catholic China Association, who was instrumental in bringing this off and uh, had an illness and could not make it. He'll be well, but he regrets that he could not be here in person tonight. Before we go to Ian, our, our uh, featured speaker, a couple quick ground rules. First, please silence your cell phones. Um, and second, after Ian gives his talk, I'll introduce our respondent in China, Kiareto Yan, waiting in a Zoom, in, on Zoom. And following Kiareto's remarks, I'll moderate the discussion um, between them and with you all gathered here. So please be ready with some questions, whatever is prompted by our presentations tonight. And remember, we will have a wine and cheese reception after this, and believe me, we'll all need now, Ian Johnson is the Stephen A. Schwartzman Senior Fellow for China Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist who lived in China for more than 20 years. As you can see, he's a regular contributor to the New York Times and author of several um, excellent books on China. And in fact, um, Ian recently had a, a piece in the New Yorker magazine on Jessica Chen Weiss, titled A Professor, who challenges the Washington consensus on China. And Ian himself can be very challenging, and we're looking forward to his views tonight. Ian, deliver. <laughs> so, uh, thanks very much for coming out on this rainy evening, and 
also to the people on Zoom. Um, I'm here to uh, talk about an aspect of China that doesn't get maybe a lot of attention, and that's the uh, faith and value systems in the country, but especially what I'm going to talk about is maybe even a little bit more unusual. That's what the governments, um, you might think of it as the use of religion or the attempts to use religion. Uh, so I'm going to, and I, I use the term civil religion. We can talk, we'll get into that a little bit later. But first I wanted to talk a little bit about the background uh, to what has been over the past 40 years, a kind of religious revival in China. Uh, and and what the government's reaction has been to that uh, to that revival, that return of, of faith and values to China. Uh, for people on Zoom, I'll have a few slides that are blank. Um, don't worry about that. That's just where I want to take the uh, focus off the image for a little while. But um, the images will continue, and then we'll. Um, well, the, yeah, so don't be worried about that. For the audience, it doesn't, for the live audience, it doesn't really matter so much. Um, so I talk about the return of religion. I'm not sure how many people in the audience are familiar with the situation of religion in China, but basically, in the, um, after the People's Republic was founded in, the 19, in 1949, there was an effort to organize religion in China into five faith groups, um, Taoism, Buddhism, Islam, and then for administrative purposes in China, Christianity was divided into two separate groups, Catholicism and Protestantism. And so those are the five accepted religions in China. Um, that By the late 1950s, these five groups had been largely overwhelmed by what the party euphemistically called leftist excesses, which meant um, extreme version of uh, of Maoist thought, which erased most of the religious work, the, the at least the legal, official, above-ground religious life in China. Most churches and temples and mosques were closed, and things only really uh, recovered later. So these are, you know, sort of famous images of the destruction of the religious infrastructure in China in the 60s and 70s. Um, and we don't need to go into all of that, but it's just important to realize that starting in the late 1970s, in what we now call the Reform Era, religious life returned, official religious life, legal religious life returned, but uh, again, only in these five acceptable uh, faith groups. Taoism, China indigenous religion, Buddhism, Islam, Protestantism, and Catholicism. Um, the government's view in the in the uh, in the uh, reform era was that this should be of importance: economic growth, and that this was would be sort of the benchmark for how people should focus their lives. Um, this was actually a picture that I took in 1984 at the 35th anniversary of the uh, PRC in Beijing. This is a giant float showing the ever-increasing industrial production up, 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 100% 1949. And by 1983, it was already at 5,730% and just going to head further upwards. And this should be the way people kind of organized and thought of their lives. It should focus primarily on economics. Um, however, uh, the five official religions were allowed back. Um, they were reconstituted, seminaries, training schools were reopened, but the party primarily saw it as a, maybe a saw to society, as something maybe that older people would be interested in, and then eventually these older people would die out, and China would march towards socialism and then communism, where religion played very little role in, uh, in daily life. Um, we can see this as an analogy, analogous to, in the West, the belief in the modernization theory. That is, countries or so societies got richer and more developed, that religion would play less and less of a role and eventually sort of evaporate. Um, this was taken to an to a extreme degree, maybe, in China. The overall feeling in the 1980s was, instead of trying to force religion's destruction, they would just allow things to play out a little bit. And in general, the government ruled China with a lighter hand after that. Um, these are a few images of what actually happened. There was a revival of religion. Uh, it wasn't just old people who went to temples and churches and mosques. It was people from 
uh, all walks of life and different age groups, um, religion kind of took off in terms of the uh, number of, of, certainly the number of temples um, and the number of young people who would attend these as well. So it was no longer, it wasn't as the party imagined. Uh, it was something that was much uh, more vibrant and more widespread. And I think this was a reflection of this economically focused vision of society that the party was offering. That this was not enough for most people, it's not enough maybe for humans in general, right, to, um, to just have um, economics be the, the basis of your, of your life. Um, so these are some pictures uh, taken in the 2010s of various religious law, uh, sites, sites around China, uh, churches and uh, temples. Um, the state reacted to this in different ways. Um, and I should say, it maybe as, a, as, as, a, as an aside, I focus most of my attention on ethnic Chinese, so Han Chinese. Um, this is the focus of my study uh, because for language reasons and for when I was living in China, I didn't spend, I have been to Muslim parts of China, but it is not the center point of my research. So while I can talk about it, and I'll bring it up later, it's part of the overall story I want to talk about tonight. It's not the absolute focus of my, of my research. Um, so the state had various visions of how religion could be harnessed. Um, the picture in the center is the former head of the uh, State Administration for Religious Affairs, Ye Wen, who sort of had this idea that religion could be useful uh, in society, that it could be uh, maybe a, a supplement to the values in uh, society. He eventually, this isn't to say that China had an extremely tolerant view of religion through the 80s and 90s and 2000s, but that maybe relatively speaking, especially if we compare to how things developed over the past decade, there was a more openness to this. There was a willingness to work with local religious leaders if they were um, working with, if, if they were working with the local Communist Party, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that this person, Ye Xiao Wen, in the middle, uh, exemplified that, and that's actually kind of a neat um, picture of him sitting with other people um, on stage. But I think that what began to happen by the late 2000s, after the, say after the 2008 Olympics, roughly, if you want to sort of date it, these things are never that firm or fixed, but the government began to realize that religious organizations, religious groups were part of a problem, which was the rise of civil society and other groups that were harder to control, including social media. And hence, I have some picture of Weibo, which is a kind of Twitter-like um, social media app in China. Uh, and that these, these organizations, not just, not just religious groups, but even environmental groups or women's rights groups, environmental organizations, that they were too independent of government control. And that the government had to find a way to react to this and to bring society, that maybe things had gone too far, that it was necessary in the 1980s to relax control over society, and that worked okay in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, but by the late 2000s, that things had gone a little bit too far. Um, so they um, posited the idea of wanting to indigenize Chinese religion. This was something that came up in the, this was first brought up in the early 2010s, about a decade ago. Um, when we think of indigenizing religion, we might think of images like this, um, which was uh, or paintings by um, Catholics in the 1920s uh, as a way of indigenizing Catholicism in China, or we might think of architectural forms of indigenizing uh, Chinese uh, foreign, so-called foreign religions in China, such as this uh, church pilgrimage site in Shenxi province, or different forms of, say, marriage. This is a marriage ceremony which has some traditional elements, the couple in the front about the kowtow in front of their parents and, and in-laws, but in the middle is a picture of Jesus. This is from a 
uh, traditional Catholic uh, wedding that I attended in Shanxi. Um, and that, that seems, those are all ways one can think of indigenization of religion, but it wasn't really what the party had in mind. It wasn't so much trying to make the theology or the form of religion fit into Chinese culture a little bit better, um, but was rather a form of, ex, 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 uh, of, of further control over religion, or reasserting control over, over religion. Um, and in some ways, this image, which uh, has become quite common in China, that religious sites have to show the flag, the, the national flag. Um, they have to, this mosque in Dunhuang in Western China, uh, maybe the flag isn't quite so clear, but these are all sort of new developments that churches, uh, mosques, and temples have to show um, the flag. Even Buddhist and Taoist sites, um, here, for example, this is a nunnery. This is taken from a, a newsletter of a nunnery uh, that they are listening to Xi Jinping give an important presentation um, in 2021. Um, and they're, you know, the, his speech is being sort of zoomed into the to the um, to the temple where the abbess and, and her um, her nuns are, are listening in intently. And of course, they're partially doing this as a show, right? Show where you're know, listening carefully to the party, we're listening to Xi's speech, etc. But it is a symbol of, of maybe what the party would like to uh, to see um, among religious groups. Um, I think the. the can divide the state's reaction to religious groups into two kinds. One are the so-called foreign faiths. And I put them in quotation marks because the foreign faiths that the state has in mind are Islam and Christianity. Um, and yet Islam has been in China for over a thousand years. There are many ancient mosques um, on the coastline of China where it first entered along the Silk Road. And of course, Christianity has had a permanent, uh, unbroken presence in China for over 400 years. So compared to the history of religion in this country, that's pretty close, actually. So if, it's, if Christianity is a foreign faith in, in China, maybe it's a foreign faith in the United States as well, if you remember like that. But this is how, I think the main idea here is that Islam and Christianity have foreign ties that are perhaps overall stronger than one finds in Buddhism and Taoism. Uh, although Buddhism obviously was founded in India, it's a world religion, and there are many other Buddhist nations besides China, but uh, overall the party has decided, and Xi Jinping himself has said, that Buddhism has indigenized over the past 2,000 years, and it's now an indigenous Chinese religion. Whereas I think Islam and Christianity are still seen as problematic religions. Um, you know, Muslims are part of the global ummah, the community of faith around the world. Pious Muslims are supposed to go on the Hajj, which means traveling to another country. And over the past 20, 30 years, some uh, Muslims have gone to neighboring nearby countries like Malaysia to study in madrasas and so on. And so the party sees that as problematic. Um, and then for Christianity, of course, there's the global community of Christians, which often supports um, Chinese Christians, and this is also seen as uh, potentially a problem, especially when one thinks of, of the state's interest as primarily being to be able to assert some kind of control over local social groups. So this is where this, the state, this is why the state is divided these two groups. Um, and so I'm first going to talk about a little bit about foreign faiths. This is something that people may be familiar with already from news reports over the past decade. Um, Islam, uh, I don't, probably don't need to go into too much detail about the crackdown on Islam or overt signs of practicing one, one's faith in Muslim communities. There are. Uh, roughly 30 million Muslims in China out of the overall population of 1.4 billion. That's not a huge number, but they, they are overwhelmingly in border regions, um, including the one that most people have probably heard, Xinjiang, which is the western region in China. This has led the party to ban 
things such as, well, it made it very difficult to go on the Hajj. Um, it's made it, it considers women wearing the headscarf to be a sign of extremist Muslim behavior or men who have beards. Um, uh, halal restaurants that uh, do not serve pork and alcohol are considered to be too extremist. And people who are, you know, even in their homes, if they have the, uh, you know, often you see in you know, Muslim home, people will have a rug on the wall in the Kabbalah in Mecca. This is seen as, as too Muslim. Um, and so there's been an effort, at, I would call it forced cultural assimilation. Uh, other people use the more emotively laden term of cultural genocide. Um, but in any case, an effort to push down the presence of Islam in people's lives. Uh, including the destruction of shrines in the desert in Xinjiang and the setup of these re-education camps where people are forced to, uh, well, the, the government would call them extremist deprogramming centers, but um, according to reliable reports, hundreds of thousands, up to one million people, out of a population of eight million Uyghurs have been have gone through these camps, so they seem to me like more. There can't be that many extremists. It's it's clearly an effort to uh, eradicate any sort of uh, cultural identity based on religion. So that's and then in terms of Christianity, we have to kind of divide uh, the story again into two. Um, there's Protestantism. Uh, one of the trends that was quite noticeable over the past 20 years uh, is that there was always, from the beginning in China, two churches. This, this goes for Protestantism as well as Catholicism. There's the above-ground legal church, and then there's the underground sort of illegal church. But when religion returned in the 1980s, uh, the government issued a benchmark document called Document 19, and it explicitly said that underground churches were OK. I think, you know, they thought of them primarily maybe as house churches, as just churches that would meet in somebody's living room, but they could understand why people might not want to go to state-run churches. And so they said, okay, well, that's, that's okay, you can do that. Um, and this then began to develop over time uh, into a very sophisticated and much larger religious group than the government probably envisioned uh, in the 1980s. So. The number of Christians, maybe this always gets to the statistical numbers and statistical debates. Um, I'm more conservative on the number of Christians in China. I would say there are roughly 60 to 60 million, 60 to 70 million Christians. It's sort of a guesstimate based on numbers. There's no real uh, reliable, there is no reliable survey data that's uh, public, at least to we know of. Um, but the government, um, gives lower numbers, but if we assume, especially in Protestantism, maybe a two-to-one ratio of underground to above-ground Christians, you can easily get to 50, 60 million Protestants, and then maybe another 10 to 12 million Catholics. Um, again, so in the case of Catholicism, maybe split 50, 50 underground, above-ground. Um, so these churches began to become much bigger than just house churches, you know, in, as you might imagine, in somebody's living room with some small infrastructure. They became almost mega churches, like this picture here that you see on the screen. And the government, uh, they had their own kindergartens, sometimes even their own seminaries, bookstores. Um, they had their own uh, structures uh, for governing, depending on the, on the particular denomination. Uh, and these uh, churches, I think, the government then began to close them down. These are largely urban-based big churches. Uh, and the government closed them down by saying that they, often on technicalities, building construction technicalities, or saying that the lease wasn't valid or something like that. But these big churches were then, in this case, and in some other cases around China were demolished. And there was a, a particular church that I followed that I wrote about in my book, The Souls of China. And uh, that was in, in Chengdu. It was a big, big urban church called Early Rain. And it has been broke. It, the, the overall superstructure, the organizational structure of the church has been 
uh, destroyed, and now there are just small sort of, again, the house church, church living room type structures that, that exist. Uh, this is not across the board, but it's overwhelmingly the way that the government has treated Protestants, um, Protestantism. Uh, by trying to return it to this earlier house church form and to get rid of the big structures, because again, the structures are civil society. These are self-organizing, self-financing uh, organizations. So they meet the classic definition of civil society, independent organizations not under government control. And that is the main problem that the government has with all of these groups. Not, again, not just religious groups, but other groups, be they environmental, uh, feminist organizations, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in you know, one case, uh, they just said the, the presence of these churches is simply too big in the, in the uh, cityscape of, of the area. This is in uh, Jinjiang province. They went around and removed the crosses off the tops of buildings from about uh, several hundred churches. They just simply, okay, we're not gonna have these crosses on top of all these buildings. We're just gonna knock them off. The churches can stay but we just don't want to make Christianity so present in our communities. Uh, so it's again the government's lack of comfort in dealing with, um, with these groups. In the case of Catholicism, the uh, government took a different strategy, I would say more, let's call it the diplomatic strategy. And this was to try to strike a deal with the Vatican over how bishops are consecrated, um, this is a place in, in Fujian province that I, I visited and did some reporting on. Uh, and, and that, so the, the main issue, again, I'm not sure the, the level of familiarity that people have in the audience, but the issue with Catholicism was mainly how bishops were consecrated and thus how uh, priests were appointed. For people in the underground church, uh, Chinese government appointed bishops who were not legitimate, and therefore the churches under them were also not legitimate, and this forced people uh, to worship in the underground church. Um, some bishops were approved by the Vatican, others weren't. So the government, so the, uh, the, the Vatican and Beijing came up with an agreement where they would jointly appoint bishops. Uh, to mixed results, um, that's not really the focus. We can go into that. That would be sort of a long, complicated uh, discussion about whether this is selling out the underground church or a realistic compromise that was necessary. In any case, this was what, what, what happened. This has been the approach the government has taken toward Catholicism. In this one particular uh, area that I visited, called Mindong, in the, in the middle of Fujian province, there was an underground um, bishop who was forced to. Uh, resigned in favor of the government. This was his uh, cathedral that was built with local donations, without government approval. Um, but then you can see the government is offering also carrots. It's not just that you shouldn't off, you should worship with the underground church. You should worship in the government church because the government church is way bigger. It's up on a promontory overlooking the ocean. It's this dramatic church. I took a picture of this when it was under construction a few years ago since then it's been completed. Um, and so we can give you better hardware and infrastructure and stuff like that if you play ball. Um, but this is, this is one part of the government's response. I think this is, when I think of civil religion, I think of government using religious images and ideas to legitimize its rule. And this is really what the government is doing with the other two religious groups in China, uh, Buddhism and Taoism. And these are the local faiths, um, as the government would say, or the indigenous faiths in China. Um, soon after taking power in 2012, it's been over 10 years now, Xi Jinping visited um, History Museum, declared the China dream, and began in a kind of remarkable way to embrace or at least give the seal of approval to certain faith groups. The government has always had its own value system, its own uh, ideology, which is communism, and it's had heroes, which are basically the equivalent of saints, 
in the communist pantheon, like this person, Lei Feng, who is supposed to uh, be a selfless, uh, rustless screw in the machine who would work for the common good. He died doing a good deed. And the Communist Party played up these people. They still exist. Uh, this is a bulletin board in Beijing. You can still see the red and white image of Lei Feng on the top left. He's wearing a sort of big army hat that looks like it has wings um, on the side. He's, so they, 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 they haven't given up on the communist iconography and ideals and ideology, but they are trying to, I, I believe, buttress legitimacy by adopting certain um, religious ideas or religious philosophical ideas that have been at the core of Chinese faith over the past few centuries or millennia. Um, here he is in 2013, again, just shortly after taking power, took power at the end of 2012, already in 2013, he's visiting Confucius' hometown, um, and he said some nice things about the works of Confucius. Um, the guy on the, on the left, on the right, is the party secretary of Chu Fu, Confucius' hometown, looks like he's having a heart attack. And indeed, a year later, he was removed from his post for corruption, uh, which was uh, Xi's favorite way of sort of getting rid of people that he didn't like. Um, and she also explicitly endorsed a neo-Confucian philosopher, Wang Yangming. Um, Wang Yangming was a Ming, you know, roughly 500 years ago, a Ming Dynasty era philosopher, who interestingly, uh, one of his most famous ideas is uh, the thing that Xi Jinping often talks about the most is um, ideas and action. So you should you should do what you think, you should do what you believe, but also the idea of an independent conscience. This is something Wang Yongming promulgated, um, and something that Xi has sort of said. This is he's my favorite philosopher. I read his stuff. Um, and this picture I took at a Wang Yongming theme park in southern China which was made at the site where he meditated in the cave and attained enlightenment and came up with many of his ideas. He was banned by the court. I actually, it's an interesting complex figure. It's more than, uh, when you look into these, some of these people who are endorsed by the party, they might almost be anti-authoritarian figures. He was banned by the court, exiled to the south of China for standing up for uh, his ideas and while down there, meditated and so on and so forth, and came up with this philosophical idea, and was later rehabilitated by the emperor and served the empire. Um, he has also explicitly met with Buddhist leaders, uh, taken hands with the leading abbot, this one from, uh, from Taiwan. Um, they were, he was given permission to build not just the temp the temples in China, but also libraries and seminaries education centers to train uh, Chinese lay people in Buddhist ideas. So this is something that's quite remarkable. Previous Chinese leaders have not done this. Um, you also see there's a huge building boom. If you go to Buddhist or Taoist temples, uh, this is a Taoist uh, temple complex near Nanjing on Maoshan. I mean, you can see it's 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 all this is all this is all new. Subsequently, this has been completed, um, and the justification for the rebuilding is that back roughly a thousand years ago, uh, Mao Shan had something like with the, they measure temples by the number of rooms they have in the halls, and you know now it has something like 500 rooms. But a thousand years ago, it had 5,000 rooms. And so they're sort of saying, well, we can easily increase this temple massively uh, based on historical precedent. So, you know, in China, uh, there's Chinese history is so long, there have been temples built almost everywhere if you dig. Uh, so you can sort of always find a justification to rebuild a temple or to expand a temple. Uh, but you see this uh, across the country. Um, the other thing, which I think is really interesting, and maybe the most, in a way, if you were a hardcore atheist leader, which you would find maybe the most controversial, would be, would be embracing groups that were once declared to be superstitious. So when the government declared that there were five kinds of religion and five kinds of religion only in China, they excluded a vast swath of Chinese religious practice which is often known as folk religion or popular religion. This is the worship of holy mountains, historical personages, 
um, you know, you can think of the god of wealth or many Chinese New Year practices, um, and including pilgrimages to certain mountains. So outside of Beijing, there's a very large mountain called Miao, not a large mountain per se, it's, it's an important pilgrimage for about several, several hundred years called Miao Feng Shan. The groups that would perform were in the Mao era mostly banned, and then they made a comeback in the Mao, in the reform era as just as cultural practice. So you see this, this person here looks like they're doing some kind of martial arts with stick, stick fighting. You can understand this just as a kind of martial arts, just as you can kind of understand Bach as a purely secular uh, musician. If you wanted to just think of Bach only in terms of the concert hall, you could understand Bach as a secular musician, but you could also understand Bach as, as a writer and uh, of sacred music, of course, the cantatas and so on and so forth, the, the masses. By the same token, you can see these people as simply martial artists, but their main goal is to perform for a deity at a temple fair. And not only does the government now allow this, but it explicitly supports them using a UNESCO term called intangible cultural heritage. So intangible cultural heritage is stuff not like the Great Wall, not like the Forbidden City, but things like uh, it could be something like cuisine, or it could be dance, it could be drama. But as in many traditional societies, in China, these things have a spiritual component. And groups like this now get government money to keep their group together. They get rooms in the local housing area where they're based in Beijing. And when they make their pilgrimage up, they get sort of spending money to pay for the gas for the bus to take them all up and perform. The actual mountain itself has been declared an intangible cultural heritage site. Um, not the actual mountain, but the pilgrimage itself. And so the pilgrimage gets government support. Um, so in the form of sending firefighters to make sure that nothing happens when people are burning tons and tons of incense, uh, having the police pr uh, do crowd control, etc., all sort of gratis. Um, but you, you, know, you can't imagine this happening at a Catholic pilgrimage or at a Protestant church where they're given this kind of support, right? But um, at these places, they are. Um, I know people who are who go to these pilgrimages, they're civil servants, they're giving the day off to go, oh, well, my group is going up on Friday. Oh, no problem. Go ahead and take the day off and go to the pilgrimage. No problem. We won't, we won't be, you know, won't count against you or anything like that. So this is considered to be a good thing. Um, for local leaders, supporting this kind of cultural practice is uh, seen as one of the things they ought to be doing. You know, government leaders used to be judged just by economic growth. Are, are they you know, revving up the economy fast enough uh, and making people rich? And is local society stable? Those were the two benchmarks for whether a, a, a party leader was doing his or her job. Now it's also, are you supporting traditional culture? Do you have intangible cultural heritage projects? So it's like this race to, to find intangible cultural heritage and to support it. Um, so this, again, doesn't, it isn't always religious based. Again, it could be some chef in Sichuan who makes Chinese cuisine, they get intangible cultural heritage that has zero religious component. But in many cases, I would say half the cases, probably it does when you look at, at, at these. And these are big events, right? This is the, when I mentioned they need to have firefighters on hand to make sure nothing gets out of control. This is why, because when the incense is burned, a lot of incense gets burned on the first night and, the, and a certain uh, nights of the of the 15 day temple fair. Um, you know, you could say so, so. This raises the question of: Is this a kind of civil civil religion that the government is promulgating? It's an open question. I th I think it is. So I'm interested in people's feedback, questions, and critiques. Um, civil religion became big in this country through the work of Robert Bella. Uh, sociologist who wrote a book on civil religion in America, and he was working, I mean, he didn't coin the term, it has an older, uh, you know, history, but he said that certain things in American society that we think of as maybe just, that, that are kinds of secular forms of religion, um, you know, worshiping the Statue of Liberty and stuff like that, and the way July 4th is celebrated and parades and, and that kind of thing um, has a religious component to it. In China, and yes, 
Three <laughs> big shots. Uh, and this is how Bella kind of, you know, imagined it, this deification, right, of certain things in American uh, political life, essentially. You know, George Washington and all the sort of myths around him. Um, you can also see it in China. Even before Xi Jinping, Mao's tomb being constructed right in the heart of Beijing, right in the center of Tiananmen Square. In front of him, this obelisk, the uh, monument to the people's martyrs, right? The, the, the Communist Party has martyrs, and it has a, a cemetery on the outskirts of Beijing that has all, the, all of these martyrs. And it's not just a couple of martyrs. Martyrs go down all the way from national-level martyrs to provincial-level martyrs to county-level martyrs, village-level martyrs, who all died for the revolution. And many of them have monuments in their home town or, or village, or at least some sort of collected monument where people go and lay wreaths. I mean, it's also really interesting if you even look at the religious symbolism in very communist-style buildings, such as the Great Hall of the People, which flanks the Mao uh, mausoleum in downtown Beijing. Um, there is the... Oh, yes, let me just say, this was built in the 1950s, and it was opened in 1959 for the 10th anniversary of the People's Republic of China being founded. Um, the columns are resting on lotus petals, which comes from, from Buddhism. There are 12 columns, which match the 12 columns in the Hall of Supreme Harmony in the Forbidden City. The floor space was purposefully expanded in, during construction so that the floor space would exceed the floor space in the Forbidden City. Um, it has 34 rooms, one for each of the provinces and regions of China, which is also um, a parallel to other structures that dynasties had in traditional China. And it has, it is sort of united under this, when you go inside the Great Hall of the People, under this great red star, the heavens above it, um, and the seating was also expanded to 10,000. 10,000 in Chinese yuan, you know, is a very important number. It sort of means limitless, um, and that was also per all purposefully built in. Um, so this is even predating the most recent efforts. You can see this quasi uh, playing off religious things. But even now, when you go around Chinese cities, you can't help but see these kinds of things uh, pushing things like, in this case, a, a poster for cultural self-confidence, which is not necessarily religious, but uh, next to it, another um, poster pushing uh, Beijing traditional culture. Um, this is an exercise spot in, in Beijing, just a small little corner uh, park, uh, which has that, that guy I mentioned before, that Neo-Confucian philosopher in his theme park in the South, Wang Yangming. This is his key idea, uh, talk or whatever, words and action. Right, yen, yu, shi. So you can see these ideas being pushed by the government as a way to, I think, legitimize this rule. Say it is the upholder of traditional values and religiously imbued religious values, uh, cultural values. Um, you know, the, so this is all very interesting. I, I think it has certain implications. Uh, we talk about opportunities. Um, the opportunities could be that we can also see some commonalities in some of these ideas of, of ways to engage with uh, China, but there are also risks, I think, and the risks is that China is a multicultural, multi-ethnic nation. When the, Pe the People's Republic largely inherited the borders of the old Qing dynasty, which included many people of different faiths and, and so on. Um, this is a map showing the, 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 the Buddhist sites in China, you can see all the red sites are Tibetan Buddhist sites. When I was talking about using Buddhism, uh, that did not include Tibetan Buddhism. That was talking, that was primarily Han Chinese, ethnic Chinese Buddhism, not Tibetan Buddhism. Um, and of course, the Western region of China, this is, the, this, um, this is where Islam is primarily located. Um, these groups are also sort of excluded from this uh, effort at synthesizing religious and, and, and religion in the state. So it's a, a kind of exclusionary vision 
of how the state can harness religious and philosophical ideas, one that I think has inherent tensions for the People's Republic of China. We've seen this, there have been protests overseas against China's um, treatment of Muslims, and we see a huge online uh, community of people who are not happy with the treatment of, of Christians. I mean, overall, I think, though, the amount, the building of religion and the state is something we're going to see more and more of in China. Um, and this puts religion sort of back in the center of Chinese society and Chinese politics. And I think it should be something that when we're thinking about China and how to engage with China, it should be something much more present. It's not just something for certain uh, interest groups in China or interest groups in this country, but it's fundamental to how the state sees itself as the defender of um, tr so-called traditional Chinese culture and, and faiths. You could make a parallel, perhaps, to Vladimir Putin's Russia, where Putin has um, cast aside his atheistic past as a KGB agent and is now sort of a defender of the faith going to church. Now, Xi Jinping does not go to temples and worship and kowtow and light incense, but you can see that his government has certainly felt comfortable in using these ideas. So I think with that, I'll leave it with this picture, which is something I took at a temple outside of, in, in, in uh, Hubei province. Um, this shows the core socialist values and a Taoist deity that had just been delivered at the temple from a stone mason's place. But I think it does neatly encapsulate the melding of religion and values. So with that, I'll stop my presentation. Let me just quickly uh, introduce Chiaretto, who you can see up there. Um, and you can see his biography there, so I don't need to go into it. Uh, Dr. Qin Shun Chiaretto Yan lives in Shanghai. He's a visiting professor at St. Joseph's University in Macau and at the National Seminary of the Catholic Church in, um, in China. Chiaretto, thank you for joining us from Shanghai. Take it away. Good evening. Good evening. Although uh, I'm in uh, in the morning here, so um, I'm a Catholic. My um, primary area of research is religions and cultures of Asia and interfaith dialogue. My observations and responses are more from a Catholic perspective as well as a Chinese perspective. So um, on the screen, you see that uh, as a response uh, to uh, Ian's uh, presentation, uh, I, I try to answer these three questions and uh, come up with um, uh, to see engagement as an opportunity as to the title of this uh, uh, conference engagement as opportunity, and even uh, see it as a possible game changer for international relations. So it's three questions and one possible game changer. To uh, Ian's question, uh, is the party still allowing some religions, especially Buddhism, Taoism, and folk religions uh, to grow? But at the same time, uh, eyeing uh, the Abrahamic religions like Christianity, Islam, more skeptically. My way of looking at it is more uh, from, from a Chinese perspective. Among the five official religions recognized in China, actually four of them came from outside historically. Buddhism came from India. Islam is linked with ethnic minorities at the border with Central Asia. Christianity also came from the West. The only religion locally born is Taoism. Plus Confucianism, which uh, is not, we don't consider as a religion here, but has played a mainstream role throughout Chinese history. Government officials were selected based on imperial 
exams on Confucian classics since the Han Dynasty 2,000 years ago. I had a chance to accompany the, in 2015 a delegation of the Italian section of Religions for Peace to visit uh, religious venues of the five uh, religions, official religions in China, and talk with religious leaders. The uh, present uh, government officials of the Communist Party today are pretty much like China's mandarins historically. The Confucian approach towards religion is to keep them in the private space and out of the political realm. From very early on, Mahayana Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhist monks in China were confined to temples in the monasteries at the outskirts of the cities. Therefore, uh, in a certain sense, there's a subordination of religions to temporal authority. The government is supposed to uh, administer the country. Why in uh, Europe, historically, spiritual authority is above temporal authority? Just think of uh, uh, Charlie Main, uh, the Roman uh, emperor, holy emperor, was crowned by, pope, by the Pope, and even uh, the coronation of Napoleon, uh, to a certain extent, is implicit of that. While in, uh, um, in China, uh, the uh, temporal authority is to administer the, uh, the religions. With regard to skepticism towards uh, Christianity, both Catholic and Protestant alike, since the 19th century has been associated with Western imperialism in the minds of the Chinese people. The Chinese government, because of this perception, is cautious that religion, particularly Catholicism, which is well organized at the international level, may become a political tool for foreign interference, true or false, but uh, similar issues in Tibet and Xinjiang are largely associated with terrorism and separatism. At least this is how the uh, government perceived it. Catholicism and Protestantism are considered two separate religions. Um, did the Chinese government separate them on purpose for control? I mean, very often we see uh, from the eyes of uh, the government is doing this and that, you know, to, to, for control, to separate them. But it might not be so, because historically, um, there are historical factors. Catholics and Protestant missionaries arrived in China in separate periods with two sets of uh, terminology, calling God, for example, uh, for the Catholics, uh, uh, Tianzhu. Uh, that's why we, we, uh, we call Tian Zhu Jiao in, in China. Why for the Protestants, uh, they use the term Shang Di. So um, they were perceived as two separate religions because of that. And the fact that even the Catholics are, are less than 1% of the population is considered uh, uh, an official religion in China because uh, it has a historical role and uh, have a presence uh, in history of China, Un uh, unlike, uh, for example, uh, uh, the um, Orthodox Church, you know, which, which with a small number is not, is not considered an official religion recognized. The present um, With the open door policy uh, of uh, economic reform, uh, actually there was a, a, a revival of religions after the Cultural Revolution. There have been flourishings of religions, especially remarkable increase of Buddhist and uh, uh, Protestant Christians. But it, there was growth in the five religions 
except the the Catholic Church. I have this big, big question then. At a certain point, how come there is no growth for the Catholic Church? Starting from the 90s, there were summer camps organized by Buddhist groups, prison fellowship near university campuses. Many young people and students are attracted and join them. We may say that the Protestants are more active in bringing newcomers to their groups. Nevertheless, for Catholics, uh, some dioceses also held summer camps for students and young people. And uh, Catholic student associations were formed in uh, many host countries where students study. Also, there are Protestant um, entrepreneurs, but also Catholics entrepreneurs as well, which have an, who have an impact on, on, on society and influence others. There might be different factors why Catholics are not growing in number. One major factor is that the uh, Catholic Church became taboo, just fell victim of the complex situations. I remember talking to a um, scholar of the uh, academic social science in uh, Shanghai. He said, oh, we, it's difficult for, for us to do research on the Catholic Church because it's considered sensitive. And the polarization be between the officials and the underground church, I think, uh, because of polit politicizing, and all that uh, of the situation, it has become a, a main cause of uh, not, uh, Catholics not growing. But although, as of uh, now, uh, this uh, polarization is uh, uh, diminishing, especially among the youth, Holy See and uh, People's Republic of China have signed and renewed, uh, and renewed the provisional agreement regarding the appointment of bishops since 2018. It is a breakthrough. The effect will be seen more clearly in time. As Ian uh, used this expression, civil religion concept, asked, is the state indeed supporting traditional values or um, in, uh, in uh, uh, folk religions, uh, just to gain more support to create these common values, the China dream, the core values of social, social values, just to gain support for, for their, their ideology. I find whatever the motivation, there's an opportunity as engagement I think engagement is important. And uh, as a Chinese saying goes, there's, there's always an opportunity in a, in a crisis. And I see this crisis with the, uh, uh, in the Catholic Church may, can as well be an opportunity. In fact, um, the uh, Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue uh, of the Vatican is promoting a series of Christian Taoist colloquium aiming to dialogue with China. And China held uh, the uh, Beijing Expo in 2019 on horticulture. The Holy See participated with an official pavilion exhibiting for six months in Beijing. And the religion for peace in China is quite active um, in participating initiatives on ecological civilization and world, uh, for world peace, world peace. China's um, foreign minister expressed that uh, in last September, China's, uh, China's expressed China's appreciation of Pope Francis' goodwill and friendliness in response to Pope saying that he is ready to go to China when Pope 
Francis and Xi, uh, President Xi visited Kazakhstan almost at the same time four months ago. So, um, as a uh, um, possible game changer, I see that uh, from this uh, crisis to opportunity, if a meeting between Pope Francis and President Xi will come true, if the Holy See China relations would normalize eventually, it will certainly have an impact on the whole world. It will really be a game changer, contributing to world peace and bringing about more international friendship. So this is uh, the end of my presentation. But as uh, I was stimulus, stim uh, stimulated to think, since we, we are having this conference in Fordham, a uh, Jesuit uh, university, uh, could it be possible that when the Jesuit went to China, they, in bringing uh, Christianity, Catholicism to China, at the same time, um, it's uh, also a give and take. They also present to Europe with their letters and with their translation of uh, Chinese classics that somehow influence uh, the uh, period of enlightenment uh, to, uh, to philosophers like um, thinkers of that time in Europe, uh, in France, like Botta and uh, Rousseau. Actually, the concept of civil religion is coined by uh, Rousseau. And uh, as Ian mentioned, uh, that uh, the uh, American sociologists also talk about uh, civil religions and all this process of secularization of religions. Um, and I think it's uh, thought provoking that we can make this uh, comparison. Thank you. Let's, um, let's get to some questions and answers. Ian, why don't you stand here by the podium? I'll, I'll take the, um, I want to take this around. Just yeah, use it here, stand by the podium, use that microphone. I'll stand here now if uh, folks have questions. One quick question I had for the both of you. Kieto, can you hear me? Can you? If, um, one question I had for you both is why is China even cynically using religion? I mean, the depiction of the sense of certainly Xi in, the, in these recent years is as a very autocratic person. Why don't they just stamp out religion? Is it uh, something that they can't do, or is it because they just see there's a, a great opportunity there? Sure, I mean, how different from you about it. I mean, uh, but my quick take would be that I think they that the communist ideology is not enough um, of, a, of a frame for, it's not of a, enough of a belief system for people to, to, to hold on to that. You know, I showed that picture of that communist hero, Lei Fang. I mean, kids all learn that, learn that in the high school, in their you know, elementary school textbooks and high school textbooks, but uh, most adults don't really believe in that. Right, the fact that he's supposed to be a selfless guy in the tent, let go, working, whatever, and then there's a fantastic picture being taken of him. It's clearly a propaganda thing. And so it's, I think it's hard for people to really believe and to find those stories to be convincing. Um, so I think that's why they feel a need to at least allow back in a little more of these other ideas, which are more tr tried and true over the centuries. Yeah. Civil religion is not enough. Well, that they need to yeah, imbue the civil religion with these traditional ideas. Yeah. Questions? Anybody? Please. Let me come over and give you the microphone. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I, I want to know that the support of the government for the Buddhism or Taoism make them better or worse. I mean, uh, because I, when I was uh, maybe middle school or high school, I want to choose a religion. But I, went, I, I was born in China and in 
Zhejiang province, the religion is active in that place. But when I met the Christian people in Zhejiang, they, there are some rules that I, I, I cannot admit, like it's not to be, it's not okay to be gay or it's not okay to have sex uh, before marriage. So I think it's ridiculous. So I want to go, I want to, go to the uh, Buddhism community. I, I think oh, it, it may be suitable for me, but I think they change their core value to just uh, to support the government. It's not for the original core value. So I think their support from government may maybe made the the uh, Buddhism or Taoism worse. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's true. I mean, you can. It's the same argument for the above ground churches. In China, some people feel that if you're going to a legal church, that it's also compromised by being by having government support in some way, and that's why people feel some people feel that it's not it's not okay. Um, specifically about Buddhism or Taoism, there is that it is a double-edged sword, but the advantages are also not insignificant. There's uh, this temple that I I, I showed a picture of all that construction of the temple going up the hillside um, that. We'll go to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the nunnery that, that I showed they were all listening to Xi Jinping's speech, right? So that nunnery now, by playing ball with the government, uh, they get a lot of support. They get a lot of help. When they wanted to expand the temple, they got a geologist, a retired geologist was sent out to help them survey the ground, make sure they could construct up the hill that it was safe. Uh, they also get kids to come over for culture classes from the local town. So they kind of like a a summer camp where kids come by and learn calligraphy and maybe count, you know, uh, copy out the Tao Te Ching or, or something like that. And they don't necessarily believe that some of those kids may end up being very sympathetic or believe in Taoism. So it's a way to bring people into the temples. The temples become like local resources for communities, especially for spreading traditional Chinese culture or Chinese medicine like in, in Taoist temple. So I think they view this as, a, as an opportunity. So I, I wouldn't, I, I think you're right to some degree, but it's also a help for them. Well, let me, let me ask you a question. Can you hear, if you can hear me, we're speaking about young people in China, and of course there's a lot of news about the demographic um, decline in China. Are young, who, who is religious in China? In the United States, older people tend to be religious. Are younger people being drawn to, and I'm, this is the same question to you, Ian, but Chiaretto, are young people coming to religions, whether they are traditional folk religions or Christianity? Mm -hmm. More or less, I, I, I got your, your question you know, about the young people. Well, uh, young people are open you know, to, uh, to new ideas, and uh, there's a lot of, uh, I think, more and more uh, exchanges. Uh, uh, there are many students uh, going, going abroad to study in the U.S., in other countries, uh, tourists and, and all that. No, I, 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 I'm, I'm quite optimistic that uh, uh, these exchanges will bring, uh, bring about uh, changes. Uh, the present situation in China, um, very, very often we uh, emphasize uh, also, the foreign media on uh, suppression of religions, control, and all that. No, but I, I think uh, young people are, are quite open, are very open to uh, to new ideas, and um, certainly uh, more and more in the future, uh, the uh, situation in change in, in China will, will, will change, and uh, we are in a in a critical time. Um, that uh, the, the whole world scenario, you know, is of tension. Um, so I, I, I'm, I, I, I think uh, the, uh, if we, 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 we look at things differently, you know, uh, we, if we have more exchanges, and even in, 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 in the Chinese government, there's a sense of uh, crisis, you know, to uh, facing many, many continuous challenges, and, and they try to act up. So I, I, I think the fact that uh, this emphasis on values, common values, uni universal values, is, uh, is an opportunity. You know? 
So um, I'm I'm optimistic on uh, on the future generation in in China. In yeah, no, I think that's a great answer. I would only add that I think there is a definite effort by different faith groups to reach out. And I think that the so-called traditional faiths, so say Buddhism and Taoism, have taken a page out of. Um, especially the Protestant church in China, and tried more explicit outreach. Um, you know, one of the problems that the traditional religions, Buddhism and Taoism have, is that a lot of them are on the outskirts of town, and so they um, will have, and, and, you know, it's, it's sort of a place that people go to just occasionally for a temple fair or something like that. Some of them now use more active uh, methods where they have suit, like Buddhist temples will have sutra study groups on Wednesday nights or something like that in the city, just really copying almost Bible study. Um, and they try to have more uh, outreach to younger people by having, I don't know, one temple had some computer robot that spoke to people and stuff like that. Um, I don't know who that was. Same thing church in the United States. Yeah, yeah. But I think there is an effort, for sure. I, I do, and I do see it in a lot of these places, younger people. Again, without real survey work, it's hard to give a definitive answer. Yes. Uh, thanks, Ian. I'm curious about the effect of China's zero COVID policy on religions. Um, because the government's, as you mentioned, been willing to rely on sort of like procedural violations to restrict religious practice. I'm wondering how the pandemic has affected different groups' ability to practice. Yeah, I think it's been a big problem for some of the groups, for, sh for sure. I, I haven't been in China in a couple of years because of the zero COVID policy and various other reasons. But from what my friends say, for example, these temple fairs, they were all canceled, right? They were the well, first in 2020, they were canceled. Uh, in 2021, they sort of came back in 2022, but it was really dependent on the local situation. The, the instinct, the reflex was, the reflex was to close it and to not allow these things to happen. I think now the zero COVID has been relaxed. Um, it's, it will sort of be a free for all um, in 2023, and we'll probably see a lot more events. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, as for the, the COVID, I think. You, you can see this drastic change of policy. You know, I, now it, uh, it's a normal normal life. Uh, um, I just uh, I, I I live in Shanghai, but just now I'm I'm in the in in uh, in Wenzhou. I I and then I, I travel visiting some some friends, some uh, Catholic groups, and we, I went to a pilgrimage. Uh, yeah. um, I, I, I saw uh, different groups and group of young people visiting uh, this uh, pilgrimage site in Fujian. It's quite uh, interesting that uh, at the, we talk of uh, uh, you know um, control and all that, but uh, there are many uh, things going on that uh, are noticed. No, that I, I think things will be will be normal, normalized. Questions. So, uh, first, thank you for the presentation. It was really, really inspiring. Um, my conjoint question would be: Can this openness to religious policies be seen as the future evolution of Marxism? Because this can also be seen in other Marxist countries, for example, Cuba, Laos, and Vietnam. And could, if so, could that mean? a perhaps future downplay in international Marxism that can lead to the adoption of capitalist and pro-democratic policies within these countries? It could lead to what? To the adoption of pro-capitalist and democratic policies within these countries. Well, uh, capitalists, sure, that's, I mean, that's possible in China. Uh, I think the government has lots of trouble with that, but uh, democracy, if you mean you know, uh, one person, one vote, etc. That was n is not the government's intention at all. And I think the government, I think it would, that if it ever happens in China, it will be a long way off in the future. And I don't know if I could see religion undermining one party rule anywhere in the near future, to be honest. 
I thought your again your observation about the comparison to Putin's Russia, especially yeah. in the wake of you know similar co-opting. I mean, Russian Orthodoxy is much more central to Russian identity. Would you say? Yeah, I think that's probably why. And I think also the reason Putin adopted it was also that Russia, the Russian state, is in such a precarious position and, and remains in a more precarious position. I mean, China still, despite the economic problems and maybe longer-term economic problems, has a much more functioning economy. Um, it doesn't have to... They, they don't need to resort to such dramatic, uh, say, measures as, say, uh, you know, completely adopting a religion or something like that in order to keep in power. For the government, it can be seen as something that will buttress their ideology rather than replacing it. Let me pose one final question. We're about out of time. Oh, wait, just a moment. Hi, Ian. Thank you for being with us today. And what I really wanted to ask you is a handful of Western countries, particularly the United States, have accused the Chinese government of human rights violations against Uyghur Muslims, specifically by putting them in detention camps or education camps, beating them and just the list goes on. And earlier in the presentation, um, you talk about how these groups, such as the Uber Muslims or Muslims in general, are seen as extremists. And I want to ask you, why does the Chinese government have such a problem with people like Uber Muslims? And how does their presence affect the possibility of religions such as Islam being able to coexist with authoritarian governments like China's? Well, I think there's, you know, you know ultimately, you could look at it in different ways. I think for, for one thing, there was, there is a, a problem with extremism in some parts of the Muslim communities in China. So I think like with all things, there's a, a kernel element of the truth um, in what the government's claiming, but it's just exaggerated. So the government makes it seem as if any Muslim with a long beard and, you know, whatever, who's fasting on and, and, and doing various things, um, that it, during Ramadan, that they're extremists. And so I think this is basically a form of Han chauvinism. It's, it's, a, it's an effort to impose Chinese culture on the minorities. There are 55 minorities in China, there's you know, 56 ethnic groups in China, Han Chinese make up 91% of the population. The other 9% of the population, roughly 100 million people, are made up of these 55 other ethnic groups. And so because also in China, Islam and ethnicity are bound up. There are 10 ethnic Muslim groups in China. So it's sort of technically impossible for a Han Chinese person to be Muslim. You, you are ipso facto uh, Uyghur or Hui or one of the others. So this is a thing that's you know, a complicated situation in China, but I think these areas were conquered relatively late in Chinese history over the only past couple of hundred years. And I think that there's been this sort of steady effort to send settlers out there, to send more Chinese out there, and to make it part of the uh, Chinese cultural melting pot, rather than allowing true autonomy in these regions. I think that's sort of the underlying idea, the implicit idea in these policies. Yeah, and I just want to ask one final question, both of you. Just let me, I think I need to speak into this mic. Uh, Chiaretto, um, you spoke about the, uh, and from the outside, you see the underground church, you said, and the above ground church, or the patriotic church, the legal church. We see those as two very separate, divided things, an underground church and an above ground church. What is the relationship between them on the ground? Is it as divided as we see? Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned uh, in my response, that uh, young, young people don't see, don't, don't have this burden of the past. And uh, this uh, polarization between the uh, official and the um, uh, underground church actually, uh, for me, cause, causes uh, the, the, the uh, give the reason why Catholics are not go growing. And um, I, I don't agree uh, with uh, uh, Ian uh, saying that the, uh, uh, the bishop, uh, um, was forced to to resign uh, 
um, in in the in the process of this uh, um, uh, after the uh, Vatican China uh, agreement. Actually, it was an uh, ongoing process. This reconciliation. Only at a certain point, the, uh, the bishop quit himself. I mean, in this process, uh, and I, I think if we if the uh, continue to 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 work on this recon reconciliation process uh, with the Holy See, then uh, even the uh, it presents as a a, a possibility a, a chance for the. Uh, Catholic Church to 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 grow more. So um, I would say that uh, we are very much linked to still to to the past, no cultural revolution, and the, if going back to history. Actually, China has been open, no, to uh, as I said, this uh, religions not coming from 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 abroad, and they are recognized as uh, uh, official religions in China. Um, so uh, with the uh, prevalence of, of uh, uh, now uh, even Chinese Buddhism, the Mahayana Buddhism, you know, a certain uh, in, uh, integration, interculturality between foreign religions and Chinese culture, and we, we, if we look at the situation with this this light, I think there there there, there can be can be opportunities and um, and more more. Um, you know, uh, contributions for really for for the for the whole world. Ian, do you have a quick thought on that? The underground. Yeah, no, I, I agree with. Um, I, I mean, my choice of words forced uh, to resign. It's not after as well. Like you had asked to resign or given a letter from. Uh, it was part of the reconciliation effort, and I think that you know you can say he was loyal and he, he resigned because the, the official. Bishop was, the government appointed bishop was supposed to take over that, that area. Um, yeah, no, I think, I, I, and I think that it's also quite geographically dependent. There's some areas where the above ground church is dominant and the underground church is minuscule, like in Shanxi province, and then there's other places where the underground church is dominant and the above ground church is small. And that's um, dependent on history and of a variety of, of things. So it's not like there's they're always clashing. And, and I do think there's we have to wait and see how this plays out. If there can be more bishops approved under this new arrangement, then that could really uh, help the church in China. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ian Johnson here in Manhattan. Thank you, Fioretto Yan from Shanghai. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.